Lift up a shout of praise this morning. Our God is faithful. I love that, that God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus for each and every single one of us to pay that debt that it would have taken us an eternity in hell to pay for, essentially. 
Our God loves us. Amen. The passion of our Savior. The mercy of our God. cross that leaves no question of the measure of his love our chains are gone our debt is paid the cross has
nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Who I could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name! What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. that there's power in the name of Jesus. I love that we can call out to him and he will meet us wherever we are at. He's just a prayer away. Whenever we invite him in, the presence of God just begins to change things. It's just what he does. He always changes it for our benefit. 
So God, we continue to worship you here in this place this morning because we know that your presence is here. And we know that in your presence, lives are changed and lives are made whole. You've been down long enough, no more walking in shame. Because the way that he loves you, isn't something you could change. You've been running in circles, but you can't hide from grace. Because the way that he loves you, isn't something you could change. Just like Lazarus out of that grave, our God rewrites history. Jesus, you change everything when you pour your spirit out. Just like Silas singing with Paul, praise can break down prison walls. Jesus, you can have it all. Won't you pour your spirit out? There's no reason to wait, cause his arms have been opened. That's not something you could change, just like Lazarus out of that grave.
Smack it down. Action! What does your mom talk about a lot? Mostly stuff that I cannot question and I don't know about. Reading. She's trying to get me into reading I just don't get it. Taxes. She doesn't talk about stuff. She always sings. She always sings about Beyonce. What's something your mom's always telling you? Stop talking about the iPad. No <laughs> iPad. Go brush your teeth. How does she know you didn't brush your teeth? She just knows. I can't. You can't remember? Oh. No, I can't. Oh, that's okay. Clean my room. Is your room get kind of dirty? Kind of. Kind of? Kind of. Would your mom say it's kind of dirty, or would your mom say, this is dirty? Kind of. Are you getting tired of my questions? Kind of. Kind of. Does she sing, like, worship music? It's only my dad who sings worship music. So your dad sings worship music, and your mom sings Beyonce? Yeah. If your mom was a superhero, what would her superpowers be? Fast, so she could just get the laundry done because we always have so much laundry. So much laundry. Why would she need super speed, you think? So she wouldn't be late anymore. So? <laughs> Making people's ear hurt because how loud she sings. She'd just go, <laughs> and it would just stop the crime. What does she do at work? She looks at people, or... She looks at people? Well... That kind of sounds like Facebook. <laughs> no. Usually it's just messaging. Just messaging. Just more, messaging. more, me messaging. more and more messages. <laughs> just constantly. So, how does your mom know that you love her? I tell her that. You tell her that? Yeah. Do you guys say it at the same time like you just did then? Or no? <laughs> no. Um, I give her hugs. We, we play outside and we ride our scooters and bike. How do you know that mom loves you? She does kind of stuff yeah. for me. She does my hair pretty and, and she always, always sings to me. She cooks really good chicken, spaghetti. She gives us hugs. Mom hugs are the best, aren't they? She says, you know what? And I say, you love me. And she's like, how do you know that? Because I, because you always say it. Yeah, she always says it because she loves me. She's kind to me and my brother. She's kind to her whole family. Why is your mom the best mom in the world, do you think? The only reason is because it's my mom. You love her just because she's mom? Mm hmm I love that. Awesome. Do you have any questions about my mom? No. Not interested at all in my, about my mom? Nope. Okay. Fair enough. Good job. Well, happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Southridge Church. We're so glad that you're here. We're glad that you're watching online, tuning in with us. Um, we just want you as moms to feel celebrated today and honored and cherished. And um, we just hope that you took advantage of all the things that we had to offer today. Um, my dad asked me last night, he said, are you going to do week three of Not So Blind Faith? And I just had to laugh and say, nope. I'm leaving that to my husband uh, because he's a geek about all that stuff. And so I'm learning just as much as you guys are. So we are going to call this message, Pardon the Interruption. Um, just to kind of take a break and talk a little bit about something that has to do with influence, and we will pick up with week three next week when my husband is back up on the stage. Um, I just want to say happy Mother's Day to my family. They are here. My grandmother's here. My aunt is here. My cousin is here. Um, happy Mother's Day to you all. Um, just so glad that um, just to see all of you and your families with you. Um, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Um, but I have two kids. Landon is eight. Olivia is seven. And I remember when they were little, <clears throat> they, I had a, was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and she had a few kids that were uh, a little older, and, but we both had one kid that was the same age. And I'm like, just hoping against all hope that things get better, right? Like, I was just feeling so defeated, and I'm like, things get better, don't they? And she's like, honey, no. 
they just get different. And I'm like, okay, anybody else attest to that truth? Like, they just get different? Okay, all right, cool. Uh, no, but my kids are really awesome now. Um, they're eight and seven, and they're just, like, in this really cool, like, independent stage of life. Um, they can, like, use the microwave. They can pour their own drinks. They can make their own cereal. Like, they leave mom and dad alone on Saturday mornings and go downstairs, turn on Netflix, make their breakfast. Like, it's taken care of. We don't have to do a thing. Um, so I'm really loving this stage of life. Um, but they're actually in the kitchen a lot now that they're, like, independent and free and old enough to do everything. Um, and it reminds me of, like, this thing. You may know what this is. Hoverboard, like the, the toy like thing everybody wants. Um, Landon got this for Christmas. Um, his, my sister-in-law asked me um, this past year if it would be okay if she got him a hoverboard. Because, like, you know, some parents are, like, not cool with it. I'm a cool mom. So I'm like, yeah, of course you can have a hoverboard. Like, I know all the risks. Like, break your arm, house fires. Like, it's no big deal. Uh, but, you know, so she got him a hoverboard. And I was expectant of all of the risks and I was okay with it all but what I did not expect was for this thing to sit in the floor in every room of our house at any given time like he rides it around everywhere like he needs to go to the kitchen he's to go to the bathroom like it's everywhere but when it dies it just dies like it just turns off and so he's like okay just go do something else and it just like sits like that wherever You know, you don't have to put it away. It just sits. One day we were cleaning, and I was in the kitchen cleaning. The kids were, like, elsewhere cleaning. And, like, I was cleaning the kitchen because that's just my, where I clean because I'm a control freak, and I don't like anybody else to touch stuff in the kitchen. So I'm cleaning the kitchen, and everybody else is everywhere else. And... I'm going from the cabinets over to the counter. I'm putting stuff away, and bam, stub my toe on that thing. It's not, it's not a light toy. Like, it's not like kicking a bottle of water. I mean, y'all ever stepped on a Lego? It's like that, stepping on a Lego. It hurts. And there is this awful pain searing through my foot. And I'm just so caught off guard that a choice word comes out of my mouth. We don't need to discuss what word that was. It was just not a nice word. Caught me off guard, and so that's what happened. And so I'm standing there, and I, you know, I've told this kid a million times, do not leave this in the middle of the floor. And then he does it anyway. So I say this word, I'm very angry, and I'm angry anyway because I'm cleaning, so it just like happens. And I go to say something, and I kid you not, I had no idea Landon was around, but he was. And I'm standing there, about to say something to him. You know, like, don't do that again. And he just walks past, like very nonchalant, casual, and he goes, you just said a bad word. <laughs> Happens. I've had these conversations with my kids. My, kid is, my kids are in school, they learn words, they ride the bus, they learn words, they have new friends, they learn words, and we have these conversations. It's not, it's not anything new, it's not like, Scott and I try to parent in a way that is, you know, it, like, it's not, like we're not scared because we've been through this before. So we're just trying to be loving and help them understand, like some words that we learn are not nice words. So we're trying to have this conversation with him. It's really, let me just tell you guys, it is really hard to have those conversations and to try to lead and guide and correct your kids away from those types of words because they're not nice um, when, when you have trouble not saying them yourself in those moments. And, you know, Scott and I, we had a life before we were Christians, so we're not strangers to these words. Like, it's hard to unlearn these things. But even in that moment, when your kid calls you out on that kind of thing, it stings. It stings a little bit. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. When 
you have kids, when kids are around, they watch and they listen always. They are your captive audience. And even if you don't have kids, even if kids aren't around, people in your job, people in your school, people in your church. Let me get a show of hands. Who's a people watcher? Anybody? See? There's people in here watching you right now. Everything that you do and everything that you say, people are watching and they are listening. So I want everybody to, we're going to do a little bit of an activity. I want everybody to close their eyes. I won't pie you in the face, I promise. If you can trust me, close your eyes. Think of a good day. Think of like your best day ever. Not anything like out of the ordinary, but like your kids are behaving, your bank account is full, you and your in-laws are on good terms. Anybody that one? Uh, You made it to work on time for the first time in a long time. Maybe you and your spouse are getting along. Those are good things, right? I want you to keep your eyes closed as you imagine your best day. Bam! Hoverboard. What is your hoverboard? What is the interruption in just a seemingly good day? What is your season of life that you thought would be over? What is this frustration or this thing that you didn't expect to happen or that you didn't deserve? What is that thing in your life? I want you to, I want you to think about that as we go through this. When, when I, that whole thing transpired and like Landon called me out, my husband looked at me, he was in the kitchen, and he goes, you going to say anything? You going to say anything to that? And I'm, I'm just thinking like, I don't have anything to say. Usually I can justify just about anything. But in that moment, I knew what I'm trying to teach my kids and then what I was doing and what I got called out on, I had nothing to say. We went to a conference this week, and um, it was a leadership conference, and it was amazing. All of our staff got to go, and then some like key volunteers. And one of our main sessions that we were in, a guy by the name of Andy Stanley, he was talking about our behaviors and our reactions specifically to like the last couple of years, especially since it was like leadership talk, things like that. And he said something like, it just struck a chord with me. And I wanted to share it with you guys because I just felt like this whole message that he had for us was so ordained because this is exactly what I was planning to share with you all. Um, Andy Stanley, he wrote, we know how to behave when it serves our purpose, but our reactions tell the whole story. And what that means is we know how to behave to make a good first impression. We know how to behave to get what we want, right? We know how to behave when it serves our best interest. But our reactions to things say what's happening underneath the surface. They say, how am I feeding my soul? Am I in scripture? Am I connected to the word of God? Am I connected to God through prayer? Am I seeking his will, not mine? And like I said, I, I will justify just about anything. If you need me to justify something for you, I am your girl. It's not, it's not a quality that I like about myself, but it's usually something that I tend to do when I'm called out on something. And I would guess that some of us do the same thing. But here's the truth, and this is what you need to know regardless of how you feel. How we react or behave in those moments of frustration of, I didn't expect this, I don't deserve this, this wasn't my fault, it will either point people to Jesus or away from him. So how I react to my kid leaving his hoverboard in the kitchen will either point Landon to Jesus, or away from him. Fill in the blank for yourself. How we react to will either point blank to Jesus or away from him. Today we're going to look at a story in Acts chapter 16. If you guys want to go ahead and turn there while we're doing a little bit of a backstory, 
Um, we're going to be in Acts 16, starting in verse 25. Um, we are going to be looking at a story about Paul and Silas. Now, Paul and Silas, they were um, ministers of the gospel. And basically what that means in this time period is that they were willing to do whatever it took to share the gospel. They were willing to be made fun of. They were willing to be mocked. They were willing to be talked poorly about. They were willing to be imprisoned. They were willing to be beaten and even killed. It's not something that you typically see this day and age in America. But that is what they were. And so what that means is that, especially in this time, Paul especially knew, hey, anywhere that I go, anywhere that the Lord calls me, this could happen. I could be persecuted. I could be killed. I could be imprisoned. I, any, just any number of things. But this particular time, Paul was given the vision early on in chapter 16 um, to go to Macedonia and help a man there. And so he's like, oh, you know, I've got this great vision that the Lord wants me to go here, and so this is where we're going to go. And so they go to Macedonia, and amazing things start to happen. Like, awesome. People start to hear the gospel. They get to share it with tons of people. People get saved. There's even a woman that gets saved. She experiences salvation for the very first time, and she helps start a church, one of the, one of the churches in Acts. Really awesome stuff. So it's kind of like, oh, like they're, they're kind of like letting their guard down a little bit. Like, hey, we, maybe this is like going to be one of those good trips. Same trip, same place. Very different day, probably like the next day. Something happens. They get a little bit of a, a little bit of a hiccup, and they're they're with this. They're walking along the road to go to the place of prayer, which is where all the amazing things happened. And they're just they're just walking, you know, not really doing anything, just walking. And there's this girl. She's a, uh, possessed by a demon. And this demon is the type of demon that allowed her to tell fortunes. And she worked for two masters that made them money for what she did. And so she, like, she knows all about them. She knows all about why they're there. And so she's like, this, th these men come in the name of the Most High God, and these men are servants of the, of the Most High God. And, and so, I mean, she's just yelling at the top of her lungs, like, as loud as she can, and I mean, this girl is just getting on their nerves. And so they're walking, and this is how like, I envision the text when I read it, is they're just like walking, and they're like, man, we got to take care of this girl. And so Paul just like stops. And just like a boss, he goes, you, out. And so he casts the demon out of her, which is a miracle in and of itself. We should not, dis we should not discount what happens, because this is a miracle, but that's not the whole story. Usually in, in most scripture, what you see, when you see this, uh, someone casting a demon out of a person, that's a miracle, and that's kind of the whole story. And usually, like, everybody starts praising God, and, you know, there's witnesses everywhere, and they're like, oh my gosh, like, this is amazing. And people's lives get transformed. Well, this time, this did not end up going well for Paul and Silas. They're having a great day, like, you know, they just cast the demon out, like, okay, cool, like, just took care of that, now we're on our way, mic drop, and all of a sudden, they find themselves beaten half to death in a prison cell, I mean, you know, two masters, they're not making money anymore, they cause an uproar, they're not, they're not happy, and so they get the Roman government involved, and they end up throwing these two men in prison after they've beaten them, doesn't turn out to be a very good day. And I don't think they really expected this to happen after the couple of days that they had had before. So we're going to be in Acts 16. We're going to start in verse 25. Verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Scott and I were in youth ministry um, about 10 years ago, and about 10 years ago, I wasn't as old as I am now, and when you're in charge of or when you're leading kids that at their oldest, 
you may be four years older than them at the max, you don't feel very influential. You don't feel like you deserve to be there. I didn't feel very qualified. But I remember just, it was a random Sunday, you know, of course they ever, they, you know, they come around every seven days, so it's not random, but it was just this, you know, normal Sunday, nothing crazy was happening, but the mom of one of these teens, she's now a beautiful Christian young adult girl, and she, her mom came up to me this Sunday and she said, I want you to know, Haley looks up to you. She watches you. She listens to you. In that moment, I was burdened for the way that I lived my life. Now, I know that this wasn't, this wasn't her mom like saying anything discouraging to me. I think it was meant to do two things. It was meant to encourage me and let me know that I did have influence. And while I may not be qualified, I was still called. But also it was a challenge. And it should be a challenge to all of us parents. The people that are around our kids and influence our kids... Like, our kids are priority number one. And so that was such a burden for me in that moment. But it's not always about being a parent or being around kids. So for some of you, it may not be kids. It could be your workplace. It could be sports. Maybe you coach a sports team. We do a lot of that in our family. It could be, it could be a number of things. It could be customers. It could be patients. It could be clients or employees that you manage. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to remember this. No matter where you are or what you're doing, you have an audience, and they are watching and they are listening. Remember the people that raised their hand said they were people watchers? Even in this room, you have an audience. People watch. I watch. I'm a people watcher. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all still here. Now, in that time, you have to know that when a When something happens like that, like if a prisoner escapes or if the prison guard loses track of a prisoner for any number of reasons, that prison guard is as good as dead. So he may as well just cut his losses. But none of them left. Why? Why did none of them leave? We don't know. I mean, we know why Paul and Silas didn't leave. They did the right thing. And that's where they were put for that moment. But if you go back to verse 25, you'll see that the prisoners were listening to what Paul and Silas were doing, how they responded and reacted to what was happening to them. See, it's not just how they see you, but they end up mimicking you. People mimic what they see you do. These moments, because people watch you, these moments are opportunities for others to see Jesus in you and either want that for themselves or want nothing to do with it. We all have that opportunity. We all have that influence. We all, you know, this day and age, everybody wants to be an influencer. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Everybody wants the followers and everybody wants the likes and and the comments and the reactions. But what happens when things don't necessarily go the way that you thought they were going to go in a conversation with your boss? Do you post about it on social? What about all the things that happen in the world and we all have an opinion about it, especially the last two years, that we you know, take to Facebook or Twitter and, and share our opinion, whether it's beneficial or not, whether it's loving or not, just because we want to get our point of view out there? but I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't deserve this. It's not my fault. He should have known better. They're just out to get me. 
I didn't deserve that. Paul and Silas didn't do anything wrong either. They were caught off guard. They didn't deserve what was happening to them. Verse 29. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even though they were wrongfully imprisoned, they had no reason to be there. They should have been frustrated and upset, but they did two things. Instead, they did two things, and it led the jailer of that prison to meet Jesus and receive salvation. First, they used their predicament to praise him. Sometimes, it's not all about everyone else. It's about you and the Lord, what's happening between you and God. We're not guaranteed a great life this side of eternity 100% of the time, right? We know that as Christ followers. But when things go wrong, we need to remember that we serve a good and loving God. We have to remember that. God isn't punishing you. God isn't smiting you. God is not doing whatever is happening but he's using these opportunities for us to grow and experience our faith in action. They also chose to do what was right. And doing what is right is not always fair, and it's not always comfortable. But Paul and, Chi- Paul and, Chir- Paul and Silas, because they chose to do what was right, the other prisoners followed suit, and not only did it physically save the man's life, it spiritually saved his life and his family. It wasn't just him. It was his whole family. Because they chose to live out the gospel when they definitely did not need to, a man and his whole family met Jesus. So what if instead of reacting negatively when things don't go our way and then we have to justify it, why don't we just lean into that opportunity to be the example of Christ and to show who Jesus really is in spite of our frustrations? Can you imagine the Jesus that people would see in you and want that for themselves? I mean, it's like, you know, let's just be real. Life sucks sometimes. But if we chose to praise him in our predicament, other people would see that. Can you imagine if that led to other people praising him in their predicament, which led to other people praising him in their predicament? Our faith isn't just about believing the gospel. It's it's not enough to just believe the gospel. We have to live it. We have to live like we believe this Jesus that we say that we believe. We have, to li- we have to live like we believe what actually happened. We have to live the, res- the power of the resurrection. Consider the people that you're around on a daily or a weekly basis. Like, think about all the different circles that you're in. But I want to speak specifically to a group of people, um, and that is parents. I said it a little bit earlier, but I want to reiterate it, bold it, underline it, highlight it. Your kids are your number one ministry besides your spouse. As a church, we get one hour a week to minister to your kids. If you come every week. Which we know, you know, think people have things, people are busy. But one hour. Maybe two if you're here for both services. You have the power to influence your kids to want, not make them live, but want to live the gospel, to receive the gospel and then to live the gospel. You have 167, I think it's 167 hours. 
I wasn't that great at math in high school, so. <sighs> I'm going to give you two points as we wrap up. Because they're your number one ministry, you have to think about two things. How you interact and handle conflict with your spouse will ultimately show your kids how to treat whoever they're in a relationship with in the future. Girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, even friends. You have that power. And how you react when you stub your toe on a hoverboard or step on a Lego or whatever that looks like for you, it matters. And your kids are listening. And they will either call you out on it or worse, they'll mimic what you do. We have such an incredible opportunity to be the light and to brighten it that is Jesus by the way that we choose to behave. So how do we do this? What does this look like? We have to resolve daily that Jesus is Lord and that we will honor and glorify him by our actions and our reactions. I want to give you guys a little bit of a challenge, and it's as much of a challenge as for me as it is for you. Before your feet hit the, hit the floor in the morning, you have to choose to die to your entitlements and your justifications of what you feel like you have the right to do and instead follow Jesus. It's not easy, it's not fair, it's not comfortable. It's not fun sometimes. That's where transformation happens. That's where growth happens. And we're responsible for the next generation. That is a tough, tough calling. That is a responsibility that I don't even think we realize that we have sometimes. I, I know that I don't. Jesus did not deserve what he got. He didn't yell or scream or talk back to Pilate. He didn't talk poorly about Judas when he knew what Judas was going to do. He stayed silent. His mission in life was to do the will of the Father, regardless of how he felt about it or how fair it was. And that should be ours too, and we can do that, but we have to choose it daily. There are a couple ways that you can respond today. Um, if, if this is a, something that you wrestle with, I wrestle with it. I, you know, that was my illustration. You can come over here and no one will bother you. You can just wrestle with God. You can talk with God. Come over here or you can go back to the prayer room. People will pray with you. They will intercede on your behalf. Sometimes there are just moments that there's, you, have, you can't say, there's nothing that you can say. There are no words. Someone will pray with you. The Holy Spirit works in those moments. Let it. God, we love you. We are so thankful for what you have done in our lives and what, God, what you can do in our lives and what you will do in our lives. God, I pray that as we all wrestle with this message, Lord, that it transforms us. God, that it convicts us for the next generation and for the people that, that do not know who you are. God, I pray that, they, that we show the real picture of who you are by the way that we live. Lord, we love you. It's in your name. Amen.
Have your throne within my 